I'm a medical oncologist. I don't do surgery. I don't do procedures. I give treatments to melanoma patients, either pills or by IV, to help either prevent melanoma from coming back or to try to make melanoma go away that's there. Um, and what's really interesting is I joined the department officially in 2007, and, and since that time, the treatment of metastatic melanoma has been absolutely rev revolutionized. So when I started my practice, in actual fact, we had never had a single treatment that we could tell a patient would actually improve their chances of living longer. Since 2011, we've actually had seven new medications that have been approved by the FDA because they do just that, and two other treatments that are currently under FDA review. So after decades of essentially no progress whatsoever, we've made huge leaps in the last five years. What's been really interesting about the last five years is those advances have happened in parallel through, through two different therapeutic modalities. Patrick Hu is going to talk after the break about the advances we've made in treatments that stimulate the immune system to eliminate cancer. But the other approach that we've taken is based on an improved understanding of the molecular changes that cause melanoma to develop targeted therapy approaches that can have significant clinical benefit. And so that's what I'm going to talk about in the next 15 to 20 minutes. Very briefly, these are my disclosures. I, as Jennifer mentioned, do a lot of research, and in that research, we often work with companies to try and optimize the therapies that are currently being used in patients, and I do receive funding support from several of those companies. So just as a brief overview, what I'm going to try to cover in the next few minutes is first to actually explain, well, what is targeted therapy? Second, why do we use targeted therapy for melanoma? And then finally, to summarize this, talk about what we've learned in the process so far, and also what are we working on moving forward. And so to explain targeted therapy, I think the best way to do this is actually to put it in the context of explaining how we developed chemotherapy. As some of you may or may not know, the idea of chemotherapy actually originated from World War I. And what this really was was that we had soldiers who were exposed to nitrogen mustard gas who returned from the war and started dying of opportunistic infections. And we discovered quite rapidly the reason they were developing these infections is because the nitrogen mustard gas had destroyed all of their normal white blood cells. So it was like having full-blown AIDS, being completely immunosuppressed. The insight was that we also have patients who have cancer of the white blood cell. And this was the first time we'd ever seen evidence that a chemical could actually kill those. And so it literally was from chemical warfare that the idea of chemotherapy originated. So from that period of time in the early 1920s through about the 1940s, we finally got to the point where we reached uh, the first successful systemic treatment of cancer with chemotherapy. And this trial was led by Dr. Sidney Farber, who's shown on the right, for whom the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute is named. And from the 1950s to the 1980s, we developed most of the standard chemotherapies that we see still used in most cancers, and for a long time were what we used in melanoma. And the reason I point out this period of time is because it's really at the very end of that era in 1977 that we discovered for the first time an oncogene. An oncogene is a normal gene that we have in our body that changes somehow. It becomes mutated or amplified and deleted. And what that does is that gene now turns a normal cell into a cancer cell. And so what that really represents is the beginning of the era where we started to understand what actually causes cancer. And so from that time actually up through today, you have researchers working in many different fields to understand what is it that turns a normal cell into a cancer cell, be it melanoma, breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer. And what targeted therapy is, is the approach of using that information about what it is that turns a normal cell into a cancer cell to develop therapies that block those oncogenes, to target the exact changes that turn a normal cell into a cancer cell to fight the cancer as opposed to the chemical warfare that chemotherapy is. So why do we think this is a good approach for melanoma? So as Dr. Sai mentioned at the beginning of this, overall, when we look at cancers that metastasize and that are common in patients, melanomas have more DNA mutations than any other kind of cancer. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that many of these mutations are of unknown function. We actually know that they're there, but we don't know what to do with them. And this is actually a common problem across many types of cancers, where again, we've gotten much better identifying mutations, but the question is, is how to actually use that to improve outcomes. 
What's really unique about melanoma is that we know in almost 70% of our patients, we can identify a mutation that we can either directly target with a small molecule or that activates something that we can target with a small molecule. So this is an approach that's not just feasible for rare patients, but potentially is feasible to try in most patients with advanced melanoma. And we have the proof of concept that this can be of clinical benefit with the development of BRAF inhibitors. So BRAF is a gene that's in what we call the RAS-RAF MAP kinase signaling pathway. And we find activating mutations of BRAF in about 50% of patients with cutaneous melanoma. This is the most common mutation we see in our patients. This picture is actually of a patient that I took care of in 2009 and 2010. Back at that time, I was mainly working in the hospital. And this was a patient who was admitted to the hospital over and over and over again. He had a tumor that was involving the chest wall and the shoulder on the right, and he came into the hospital over and over again because despite all the treatments we did, the tumor kept growing, his pain was poorly controlled, he would develop infections, and what we could actually see here, this is a CAT scan with him lying down. So this is the tumor. The tumor was so big, it was actually shifting his lung and heart to the other side of his chest. And in the last time I was taking care of him in the hospital in April that year, he mentioned that he had actually just found out that he was going to be enrolled on one of the clinical trials of one of the new BRAF inhibitors called Vemurafenib. And I actually saw him about two months later when not that he was admitted to the hospital, but when he came walking in to tell us how good he was doing. That giant tumor had melted away. We could see this both on the PET scan and on the CAT scan. And not only had it melted away, but it had melted away with him having absolutely no side effects from the treatment. And so again, his tumor had had that BRAF mutation. We came with a very specific inhibitor. And not only did it shrink the tumor, but it did this in a way that didn't have the same sort of side effects that we see with chemotherapy. One of the most common and devastating problems we deal with in melanoma is when melanoma will spread to the brain. This shows that the BRAF inhibitors can also work in that clinical scenario. So a big brain metastasis in a patient with metastatic melanoma with a BRAF mutation, we started them on the BRAF inhibitor, and eight months later, you can barely see the tumor there at all. And so overall, we know that for patients with BRAF mutations, these BRAF inhibitors can be very effective. And this is an analysis that we do to sort of quantitate how well patients respond in our clinical trials. It's called a waterfall plot. And what this is is it shows the maximum change in tumor size from the time we started the treatment. So the line here at zero is where we would sort of graph out the patient's tumors if there was no change in size at all. So anything that goes above the line means that the tumor grew. Anything that goes below the time means that the tumor shrunk. And so in our phase three trial of vemurafenib in patients who had BRAF mutations, by our clinical trial criteria for response, which is where this dashed line is, we said the response rate to these agents was about 50%. But if you look at this, it's almost 90% of patients who get some degree of tumor shrinkage and disease control. And again, at the time we did this, the best treatment we had was a chemotherapy that did this in about 5% of patients. So a true quantum leap forward in terms of our therapeutic options for these patients. The key is, though, is that this treatment only works in those patients who have the BRAF mutation. If we gave the same treatment to a patient who doesn't have the mutation, what we found in the laboratory is we will actually make the tumor grow faster. So this is not a treatment we give to everyone. What we do is every time we see a patient with metastatic melanoma, we test to see if the mutation is there. And if it is, we know this is one of our treatment options. But if it isn't there, this doesn't help us. We have to figure out something else. Now again, this was all very impressive, much better than what we had seen before, but it is not without its limitations. And this is the key limitation. Although almost all patients with the BRAF mutations will respond to these agents, almost everyone goes on to develop resistance. And this is an unfortunately typical type of patient who had widespread metastatic disease. Two weeks after they started their treatment, the cancer was all gone. They were off of all their pain medications. But four months later, the cancer came back. And so we know on average, we use the BRAF inhibitor all by itself, we'll control the disease on average for six months. Some patients it's shorter, and we do actually have a small percentage of patients who are able to stay on these treatments for three, four, even five years. But right now, we don't have a way to tell what type of response each patient will have. 
Researchers like myself and Dr. Wargo and many of our colleagues have spent a lot of time and effort trying to understand why that resistance develops. And what we've actually found out is that the BRAF inhibitor comes in and blocks what we call the MAP kinase pathway. And through, again, the generosity of patients who are receiving these treatments but allowed us to do biopsies of their tumors when the treatment stopped working, what we were able to learn very quickly is that about three-fourths of the time, the reason the tumors start growing again is that same pathway that we were able to block in the beginning has been able to turn itself back on. Now, we actually knew when we found this, we had multiple different ways of blocking that MAP kinase pathway, and so we started combining them together. And this is, as Dr. Uh, Amari referred to earlier, the clinical trial results when we combined the BRAF inhibitor with another agent that would block the pathway, the MEK inhibitor. This is the result specifically with dabrafenib and trametinib, the combination we're using in the neoadjuvant trial. So now when you look at that waterfall plot, what we actually can say is that almost 100% of the patients get their disease under control when we give this treatment. Interestingly, when we put these medicines together, the side effects that each of them cause by themselves are actually lessened. Patients actually tolerate this better than taking either medication alone. And on average, the time that this controls the disease goes from six months to almost a year. And we're still, again, this is early enough, we're still trying to figure out exactly how many patients may be cured by this, but we do still know resistance is a problem. Many patients, again, have these very nice responses, but the disease will progress. And that's why, again, we're focusing a lot of our energies on understanding why that happens so we can develop rational new approaches that will be even more effective than this one. Now, one of the ways that we're trying to improve upon the effect efficacy of the targeted therapies is asking whether or not we can do better by combining targeted therapies and immune therapies. And so again, with the BRAF inhibitors and in patients with a BRAF mutation, we know that almost all of the patients will respond to these treatments for a period of time. But unfortunately, although we get these clinical responses, it's very rare to get cures. Now, as Dr. Hu will talk about, immunotherapies are something we've used for a long time. And again, this is evolving, but historically, they usually work in a relatively small number of patients. That's getting to be more and more. And what's most impressive about immune therapies is when they work, they often can work for a very long time. Sometimes we think even curing patients with melanoma. And so philosophically, looking at the strengths and weaknesses of these two approaches, it led to the hypothesis, if we combine the targeted therapies with the immune therapies, can we get to a point where we have a very high rate of long-lasting cures? And while that was really just sort of a theoretical concept, looking at what each of the agents were able to do, this is now being supported by experiments we've done in the laboratory. So here on the left is an experiment that Dr. Patrick Hu's lab did showing that if we implanted a melanoma in a mouse and treated the mouse with a BRAF inhibitor, not only did the tumor shrink, but a more immune cells actually moved into the tumor. And while it was nice to see that in a mouse, the real question was, was does this happen in patients? And this is from a paper that Dr. Wargo's team published a few years ago. This is a patient with a BRAF mutation who underwent a biopsy before they started their treatment. In this picture, the blue cells are the tumor cells and the brown cells are the immune, the immune cells. And we can see there's almost no immune cells in the tumor whatsoever. But after being on the BRAF inhibitor for only one to two weeks, we now see that tons and tons of immune cells have been able to recognize and infiltrate the tumor. And so the question is, is if we can use the BRAF inhibitors to get the cells to the tumor, can the immunotherapies now turn those cells on so that we can eradicate the tumors not for a short period of time, but for a very long time? And so just to, again, bring this all to a conclusion, particularly in time for our coffee break, what have we learned and what are we working on? So what have we learned? Again, almost every patient with a cutaneous melanoma has many, many, many different DNA mutations. And what we've also been able to show is the proof of concept with the example of the BRAF mutation that's the most common change that we see, that inhibiting those mutations that really drive tumor growth can absolutely have clinical benefit. And it can often do it in a way that not only shrinks the tumors, but does so with very few side effects. Without going into the details, what the keys are, though, is you have to find the right patient, the right medication, and actually the right dose of that medication.
And again, with the example of what we saw with the BRAF inhibitor and the MEK inhibitor, combining different drugs together can be better than individual drugs alone. But what we also learned from the BRAF inhibitor is that there are limitations to this approach. In order to overcome resistance, we have to understand it. But if we do that, we think that we can come up with rational approaches that are not only safer, but also more effective. So what are we working on? So for those patients with BRAF mutations, as Dr. Amaria said, based on examples in leukemia, where we know that treatments that work a little bit well in patients with the most advanced form of disease can actually cure patients with early stage, we're now testing whether the BRAF and the BRAF and MEK inhibitors can actually cure patients if we use them in earlier stages of disease. And as I mentioned, multiple new combinations, including targeted therapy and immune therapies together to try to prevent or over overcome resistance. The other thing we're working on is for those 50 percent of patients that don't have BRAF mutations, what are the mutations that we can target and what are the medications that will help them? And so again, a lot of excitement about the progress that we've made, but a lot of work and a lot of research that's ongoing that we hope will provide even more benefits moving forward. So again, we'd just like to thank AIM, thank Jen and Rhoda, but most importantly, all of the advances that we've made have been critically dependent not only upon funding that we've received from multiple different sources, but actually from the willingness of our patients to participate in research. So thank you all very much. Thank you.